Jody Arias. We compare the case of Jody Arias versus Ezra McCandless. One of the interviews Jody Arias did after she was found guilty, the guilty verdict, she quickly did a interview right after the court was over. I am overwhelmed. I'm gonna have to take it one day at a time. I am shocked. I lied because I was scared. I am ashamed of it all. The sex part. I guess she was talking about her sex life. She was asked about Alex Alexander. I see a man who abused me. I see it through his family because they look alike. The public, they must get something out of this. Uh, like justice I wanted to get this over years ago I would like to get the death penalty rather than life get it over with because my family live long and I don't smoke or nothing like that. Plus, I can't stay in one spot for the rest of my life. That would drive me crazy. Martinez. I liked him at first. He said I was seeking fame with all these interviews. He's the one out there in front of the news cameras seeking fame. I wanted just to crawl under the table in shame. One thing I regret, I regret putting my family through all this. I should have just been honest. I regret what I done to my family. I try to act the part until I could no longer. I was just pushed to the point. I don't remember too much. I must have just checked out. And that Ryan Burns? I just don't remember all that he said. Kissing? Making out? Hmm. Well, you were in a fog in the desert and you had gone 100 miles out of your way. You didn't remember where you were going but you remembered how to get to Ryan Burns home and state 
you remember having gas cans and you filled them up so you didn't have to stop in the state of Arizona. You were in a fog. Your phone was switched off. It was more than switched off. You had taken the battery out so no one could get your location. I have never used or even handled a gun. Judy Arias' story changed a few times. First story was she was never in Arizona and she has not seen Alexander for months. Then she was asked about these photographs and she was asked to look at them plus she asked to look at them That's you Jody Ooh, it looks like me, but I wasn't there. As she stares at the photographs in a morbid way, when the detective said, you know, I wouldn't look at them, they're pretty you know, like violent. Yes, but I got kind of morbid curiosity kind of thing. And she wants to look at these crime scene photos and relive the moment. But when she looks at these photos, she just looks at them, takes it all in, and didn't even blink. It didn't make her sick. It's like she wasn't enjoying, she was enjoying that moment. Plus, she wanted to know what evidence they had exactly. Curiosity. Then the story changes. When she was being interviewed by the detective, the next day, she had changed her story, crawled up in a ball, sitting on the chair in the interview room while under arrest. There was two ninjas, a boy and a girl, male and female. And she starts to tell the story of these two intruders. And we think, wow, did that really happen? Yes, because the two ninjas was Jody herself and Alex, Alexander. When she told this story, there was truths and half-truths, and the scene 
the events were set. Then the story changed again and it became self-defense. Ezra McCandless went into a fog and she told her story that she had been attacked and assaulted by Alex Alexander Woodworth She told the police that he had carved the word boy into her forearm backwards. But she didn't say backwards, but for Alex to carve the words boy in her arm, he had to write them backwards. She never told the police where Alex was because she was in a fog and she didn't know where he had gone. He had run off. She could not even remember her name because she had changed her name to Ezra McCandless a few years ago because it suited her. In this fog and her memory loss, she didn't know nothing. She could hardly speak. She was hysterical. But there's only one thing she can remember, and that is Jason Mingle. And she gave the police his phone number to call. In Ezra McCandless, last words to address the court. I'm sorry. Sorry, don't cut it. Can't find the word sorry for this loss. Because this loss, I feel a great loss. This pain, I feel. Sorry. Just don't cut it. I loved Alex. She loved him. She hated him. Emily. Why didn't you apologize to them? I did apologize to them. You never said I'm sorry. I said that I said that I'm sorry, that I'll never be able to make up for what I did, and that I can never replace their loss. But you didn't use the word I'm sorry. Well, then I'm sorry I didn't say that, because certainly I am sorry. I think, in a sense, I, the, the words I'm sorry just seem meaningless, especially since nobody believes what I'm saying anyway. You said it right there, no one believes a word out of your mouth. Why do you keep talking? Because I know that I'm not just, I've lied before, that doesn't mean that I'm a liar by definition, by character. To a lot. I don't know what that means. Was I lying when I said I want to die, or was I lying when I say, please spare my life? You know, I said that I said that I'm sorry, that I'll never be able to make up for what I did, and that I can never replace their loss. You said the relationship with Mr. Alexander was very stressful. 
Some of the sex wasn't. So you did enjoy the sex then, is that what you're telling me? At times I did. It was on the sink and down the hallway. It's a took me explicit naked photos in evidence, placing her at the murder scene. Let's just say I've seen all of you. I said that I said that I'm sorry that I'll never be able to make up for what I did and that I can never replace their loss. Sarius has a few words to say. Judge, I just want to respond to a few of the things that were said earlier. Um, my legal team and I tried to settle this case on four different occasions uh, before trial. We tried two times before the 2013 trial and what Samantha said was not accurate. I was not the one who refused to settle. It was, Travis, uh, it was Travis's family who not only refused to settle and insisted on both trials, but then they bragged about it all over social media, including posting a group photo on the steps of this very courthouse, holding out all of their thumbs down, refusing to settle. As for not wanting the death penalty, it's my firm belief that death would bring me untold peace and freedom. That's my personal belief. If I died today, I would be free and I would be at peace. For years, that's exactly what I wanted. But I had to fight for my life just like I did on June 4th, 2008, because I realized how selfish it would be for me to escape accountability for this mess that I've created. I have two brothers, two sisters, several nieces and nephews, a mom, a dad, eight aunts. Nine uncles, over 20 cousins that I've grown up with as well as countless friends, all of whom would suffer greatly if I took my own life or if I allocuted and begged for the death penalty and then got it. I did not drag Travis through the mud. I protected Travis's reputation for years. I did say he was an influential person. I kept his skeletons in the closet all to my own detriment for years. What I testified to was not false. They were not made up. They were not things that I wanted to get out into public either. But when I was on the stand, I told the truth. Your Honor was also here during the second trial when a lot of evidence came to light that supported my testimony from people that never even knew me but knew Travis. I do remember as I testified to this, I'm sorry, I think I would have testified to this in the 2014 trial. I do remember I do remember the moment when the knife went into Travis's throat and he was conscious. He was still trying to attack me. It was I who was trying to get away, not Travis, and I finally did. I never wanted it to be that way, Judge. The gunshot did not come last, it came first. And that was when Travis lunged at me just as I testified to and just as the state's own detective testified two years ago before he and Juan got together and decided to change their story for trial. As for not being abused, maybe I wasn't badly as, as badly abused as Travis and his siblings were by their parents. But I didn't consider it abuse either. I didn't consider being beaten and hit and all those things abuse. That was discipline in my family. That's how my parents were disciplined by their parents. That's why I didn't consider those things abuse. I understand now that that's abuse. So for Samantha to say that I was not a victim of abuse is wrong because I was. And my family understands that now. And we, like my mom said, I didn't come with instructions. They did the best they could. They didn't do it because they're bad parents. They did it because they thought that they were disciplining us. And that's the best that they knew how. The most important thing I want to say is that I am very sorry for the enormous pain that I've caused the people that love Travis. I never thought I would cause so many people so much pain. I live every day wishing that I could undo what I did to Travis and wishing that I could take away their pain, just put it onto myself. To this day, I can't believe that I was capable of doing something that terrible. I can't even, I'm just, I'm truly disgusted and I'm repulsed with myself. I'm horrified because of what I did, and I wish there was some way I could take it back. That's all I have. Child. 
who the court has addressed as a mean, vicious person. This child in second grade saved some birds in a nest, put them in her pocket because the nest had fallen on the ground and they took, she took them to school in her pocket. I got a call from school. The teacher said, we've got baby birds in the, in the pocket. And Ezra had all her friends gathering worms at recess so she could feed those baby birds. I might want to lay down for a while and maybe just relax. When I laid down, Alex had started to come into the car with me and position himself above me. He started to describe me and he also started to speak of how he deserves this. He said pet names before, he's sweet talked to me before, but this is different because it was disconnected. It was third person. Well, you're handsome. You're this, you're that. But at this point, at this time, he was saying Ezra is instead of, it was more as if I was an object. He started to do things slowly and methodically. He first removed my glasses. He deserved this. He, I had betrayed him. I went back to Jason. He was upset about this and that he deserved me. After he kisses me and I pull my head back a bit, I felt he touched the hem of my sweater. I could feel a pull on it. I wasn't sure at the time really what he was doing but I could feel it start to give away. It felt looser and my sweater had been opened. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm limp. I'm, I'm not moving or resisting or fighting. I'm just, I'm there. After that, he moves to my pants. He starts to cut through my pants. I can feel that he's pulled on it to give room so that he can cut through. At this point, he had cut through the inner thigh area of my pants and tights. I could feel the knife start to graze and cut into my skin. I feel it on my vagina, I feel it, it's inside the hip region. In the past, only clothes had been cut but this is the first time he ever cut me with the knife. I'm afraid he's gonna kill me because he has a knife. And I'm afraid that he's going to take whatever he wants and he's just going to finish this. My mind is running through his words that he deserves this. My mind is running through all of the possibilities of what he could want, of what he's going to take. I... I was wondering if he was going to kill me and then he was going to kill himself so that he didn't have to be alone. What I start doing is defending myself. I was, as Alex is grabbing me, I started stabbing him anywhere and everywhere I could. I didn't know what was happening. I just needed to get away and just needed to get out of the car. Were you consciously aiming for any particular place when you were stabbing him? No, it was just, it was happening fast and it, it was anywhere and everywhere. Before he gets out of the car and you're doing this death, are you trying to kill him? No. What are you trying to do? I just want to get away. I need to get out of the car. I need to get away as fast as I could. So why do you keep stabbing him while you're still in the car? Because he wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let me out. I was terrified. Alexander Woodworth of Eau Claire 16 times in March of 2018. His body was found in a car in Springbrook Township between Eau Claire and Menominee. Prosecutors say McCandless showed up at a home not far from the crime scene, barefoot and disheveled with some blood around her mouth. The 21-year-old is charged with first-degree intentional homicide. She has pleaded not guilty to the charge. Today, attorneys spent the day selecting the jury. Judge James Peterson anticipates opening statements will be made tomorrow morning. Both the state and defense are scheduled to call several expert witnesses to the stand, including law enforcement. 
That trial is expected to last three weeks. Jason Mengel. At some point early on in your relationship, did the defendant get pregnant? Yes. Did intimacy change after the abortion? Yeah, it was very, very minimal. What Alex told her about why he cut his wrist? Uh, he had told her if she didn't leave him, he was going to kill himself. And when you say him, is that you? Me, yes. They, they were both going through some things in life, and she had, you know, she had been through something traumatic. He had been through traumatic things, so they kind of bonded over, like, you know, misery loves company kind of thing. Yeah, at one point, she used to always have one in the center console, and I forget what I needed to cut, what I was going to cut, like, a, I think I had a shoelace that broke or something. I was going to cut it off and retie it, and uh, I couldn't find a knife. I think you said that was within a few days prior to uh, March 22nd, 2018? Yes. Did she tell you that she loved you? Yes. Did she tell you that she missed you? Yes. Did she tell you how much it hurt to be without you? Yes. Did she tell you how much she wanted to be with you? Yes. Did she ever talk about uh, a future together with you? Yeah. plea. Ezra McCandless from Stanley is accused of stabbing Alexander Woodworth 16 times in rural Dunn County back in March. McCandless is charged with first degree intentional homicide. She pleaded not guilty in May. She did not change her plea today, but her attorney told the court they'd like more time to review her options. Patients with self-inflicted wounds may visit the emergency department claiming an accident, self-defense, or assault. When the patient history, injuries, and forensic evidence are not consistent, the forensically informed emergency clinician is in a unique position to extrapolate the truth. So okay. the, the Dr. I hate to interrupt you, but perhaps you misunderstood my question. I don't or think so. Perhaps I wasn't very clear then. What I asked you is when you are in the emergency room, not what you've read, but when okay. you're in there, you talk, the, sometimes people will tell you why they cut themselves. Sometimes right? they do. Yes. Okay. Not all the time, but sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But you certainly ask, right? Yes. And they'll typically tell you it's to relieve pain. Um, sometimes they'll tell me it's to relieve pain. And by that, it doesn't mean physical pain. It means psychic pain, right? Or it emotional could, pain. Typically, yes. And that can be pain from trauma, right? Correct. And that can also be pain. Trauma can be from being attacked. We can all agree with that, yes. right? Trauma can be for having to fight for your life. We can all agree with that, right? Yes. Trauma can be being cut with a knife in unwanted sexual activity, right? It would be, I imagine. And trauma can be a reason why a person would take a knife and write the word boy into their own arm, correct? Yep. At this time, I have no further questions. All right, any redirect? Please? Yes, Your Honor. Actually, let's just go to that last area you were being asked about. Uh, could trauma be from killing someone? Yes. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, can I have transcript counsel that you were using? Actually, I need my own copy of counsel. Well, Your Honor, if they're going to give it to the witness, that's fine. I'll use my copy, which is different. I mean, I, I don't want to be rude. If you want to take a look at it, I go up to no, the that's fine. I'll use mine. Okay. That's fine. But this is an official court transcript I use, so I would ask that you please refer to the official court transcript. I am. I'm looking at document 299, which is the full transcript of that hearing as opposed to a partial one. Okay. Can you just hold on one second, sir? I'm going to pull that. May I approach, Your Honor? You want to approach the witness? Go ahead. Yes. yes. Uh, doctor, referring to the transcript, uh, when we talk about it, let's just get context of the questions about the exam. Uh, we're at page 41 of, exhibit, of document number 299. Uh, you were asked, uh, after you had that initial discussion with her, what did you do next? And your answer was what? Can you just read that for us? Well, Starting at line 25 of page 41 and continuing on to line 1 of page 42. Well, after the initial history, I did a physical exam on her. Okay. So your answer at Mar on March 8th was you did a physical exam of her, correct? correct? 
And that was before the SANE exam, correct? Correct. The portion that counsel was reading you about, what did, were you referring to when you said, uh, we didn't do that examination until the sexual assault nurse examiner was there? That was the pelvic or the intimate exam. So prior to the same nurse arriving, had you seen the uh, marks on her left hand? Um, yes. Had you seen the marks on her right thigh? Yes. You just hadn't at that point in time seen the ones on her pelvic area? Correct. All right. There were uh, a number of questions relating to uh, exhibit number one ninety five and <coughs> specifically page twenty seven o eight on there characteristics of self inflicted knife wounds. Do you recall that? Sorry, page 2708. Yes. It's up the chapter from Rosen's. Oh, oh, I, I had the wrong document. If you could just wait one moment. Sure. Um, sure. Get that. I have a lot of paperwork here. I'm sorry. That's exhibit 195. DOJ 002708. Thank you. Are you there? Now, counsel, you ready? Yes. All right. Uh, when you talked about those, uh, you said they're characteristics of self-inflicted knife wounds. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Are those characteristics always present in all self-inflicted knife wounds? No. Do some self-inflicted knife wounds have different characteristics than what's listed there? Yes. What are these, what are the character, what, what does it mean by characteristics of? It basically means um, trends or patterns or what you would expect to see. It's the whole reason I came to the conclusion I felt these were self-inflicted because they had a pattern. And the pattern was on the arm in, in, in words, they were, they were superficial, multiple linear ones on the palm, not involving this thing where I imagine somebody grabbed a knife or grabbed a knife, there'd be deep cuts through there. They were in the reach of a hand, either sitting down on the side of the leg, they were in the reach of a hand in the groin, and they all seemed to have that kind of same movement that they could be gotten at the groin with the right hand. So they were all consistent with that. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So if you actually look at there, when they talk about the characteristics, they talk about multiple different things like pattern, going in the direction of the hand, multiple parallel lines, non-dominant side. And the more commonly on the non-dominant side is the, nom the dominant hand inflicts the wounds. And the area that you described, uh, the uh, injury to the pubic area, was there something specific about it in addition to the uh, lines that you observed, the parallel lines that you observed that uh, you thought was important to note in that uh, examination of those? Well, the thing that was unusual about it is they were all on one side and they were on the right side. They weren't on the left side. That was what I thought was unusual and they were all very superficial. And was there also something about the angle of those injuries that was Right, that they were angled up the way that a hand would go towards the right shoulder. I think I commented on that. So if somebody was cutting themselves or mark, putting the knife against the skin in that area, they would, it would be in the direction that they would be doing that? Yes. All right. Using their dominant hand. Right. Doctor, uh, going back to exhibit 191, uh, the first page of that uh, exhibit, you were asked about her uh, complaining of the pain and rating it a 10 out of 10. Uh, immediately after that, uh, 
not the next sentence, the sentence after that, did she talk about who's, who could come visit her if they wanted? I wasn't involved in that conversation. All right. uh, but does the record indicate that the patient said that somebody could come visit her? Patient did say friend Jason could come to see her is what's said on here. All right. Now, you were asked some questions about uh, the defendant's inability to recall events. Do you know what the cause of that, her ability to describe to you what happened was? I don't, don't know for sure. Um, you know, it could have been a dissociative disorder, could have been, you know, people are not always forthright with us. It, it's hard to know at that time. I assume that it was due to the Trump. Uh, assumption. You said I'm going to run along to answer and just redirect and just I don't think it's relying on an assumption. Okay. My, my, continue with your answer, doctor. My impression is I saw a traumatized woman who had an alleged sexual assault who couldn't re remember what happened. I assume it was more of a dissociative thing or it was my assumption or impression seeing her. Um, you know, I always give the patients the benefit of the doubt because I, I you know, I'm there to care for them. That's my, that's my only agenda in this case is this was my patient. I just wanted what was best for her. That's all I wanted. And that's why I drew the conclusions that I drew, trying to figure out what I needed to do to take care of my patient. Was it a... Uh, Obsessive ex boyfriend attacked her, cut her, strangled her. She wanted to live. She fought to survive. She's here fighting again to survive. Between the posture of uh, Mr. Alexander immediately before he rushed you, according to you. Our relationship was not um, supervisor employee anymore and um, became infatuated and fell in love. And in the beginning, sex is rather vanilla. He likes to have sex with her when she's in the prone position. Because she comes to learn that he likes that look upon her in the back in which she looks more masculine. The sex grows in intensity becomes painful. I'm gonna tie you to a tree. Oh my gosh. That is so debasing. I like it. <laughs> tree. I'm going to zip, zip tie you around you on a tree. Blindfold you. And uh, put the picture blue camera on a The defendant also undergoes a sexual assault exam. It's pretty long, it takes a number of hours for this examination. And during that sexual assault exam, she's again unable to provide very little information. But when asked, how did this B.O.Y. 
be carved into your arm. The defendant states, Alex did that to me. I don't think I've ever even fired a gun. I've, I've done bows and arrows and I've done some water guns, yes, but not a real gun. The gun that I got on Friday was never used. So you're going to continue to tell me that you did do this to him? Did not kill Travis. I believe you did. I truly believe you did. And what is that opinion as to the cause of Alex Woodward's death? Multiple sharp force injuries. And can you tell us which of those injuries uh, had the greatest impact on his death. Um, that of the autopsy, that would be the sharp first injury to the head, so number one. The sharp first injuries two through four to the right side of Mr. Woodworth's neck. They would have bled profusely. And sharp first injury number 12 to the scrotum, but again, bled profusely. This uh, individual, the defendant, Jody Ann Arias, killed Travis Alexander. And even after stabbing him over and over again, and even after slashing his throat from ear to ear, and then even after taking a gun, shooting him in the face, she will not let him rest in peace.
uh, I think in every case we learn a little bit. Uh, it's unfortunate. Frankly, I, I don't recall that, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult for the family to have to be, uh, you know, on, on TV and, uh, uh, and all that. Uh, it sort of changes the way people behave, I think, when you get this much coverage. And, uh, and that, you know, you know, the coverage is here to capture what's, what happens, but yet what happens sometimes changes a little bit because of the coverage. And, uh, but I have never been involved in a homicide case that did not have TV cameras in the courtroom uh, in Wisconsin. That's, that's the way it is. So um, the court believes, uh, and here's what the court is going to do for the reasons that I've stated. Uh, I am going to sentence Ms. McCannis to uh, uh, life in prison in the Wisconsin prison system, and I'm going to uh, set the date that she would be eligible for uh, petitioning the court for extended supervision at 50 years. It's a long time, but the way I reason this, that Ms. McCandless, if she does what she's supposed to do. The court finds the mitigation presented is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency and that a natural life sentence is appropriate. It is ordered. The defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. Thank you guys for stopping by. This was the Ezra McCandless and Jody Arias trial. Both convicted of first degree murder and serving the rest of their life in prison. Jody in Arizona, Ezra in Wisconsin. Travis and Alex didn't deserve to be stabbed to death in this way, all because their love affair with them had ended and they were getting on with their life but they just had to go back one last time